Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have the honor of having Professor Raihana Habib with us. Uh, she is the Chief Scientist, uh, Division of Agronomy, uh, and Ma'am is going to deliberate on the topic of crop weather relationship for sustainable fodder production. Ma'am, uh, you have all the control. We are able to see you, and you are audible as well as your presentation is visible. You can start, Ma'am. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Professor Ayhana Habib, uh, as uh, he has uh, rightly introduced me. I'm Chief Scientist, Division of Agronomy. I would like to say that I did my BSc Agriculture from uh, Skost Kashmir, from the Faculty of Agriculture, Wadura itself, and then I proceeded for my post graduation in Agriculture Metrology, uh, from uh, which I did from uh, Punjab Agriculture University, Ludhiana. I worked in the agriculture department as junior agriculture assistant for one year, and then I joined the agriculture university in the Gramin Krishi Mosam Seva uh, project as a technical officer. And then I did my PhD agronomy from SCOST itself. Uh, so um, then I worked in KVK for three, four years, and then I headed the division of agronomy. And then now, I, after rotation, I'm uh, free. And uh, so here I am as chief scientist and delivering to you the lecture on crop weather relationship for sustainable fodder production. And you know the importance of weather. Um, if a farmer is sowing his crop this year also in his field and he is getting a bumper crop and the next year he is not getting the bumper crop because uh, with the fact that uh, he had used the same fertilizers, uh, same inputs were used, but uh, there was a difference. So that is the where the weather rules. So we say the weather rules the field, and it certainly influences the yield because it directly or indirectly influences the crops in their growth cycle. It uh, directly affects the structural characters like stand. So first of all, if in germ at the time of germination, if the temperature is not feasible, then it cannot be having a good stand. Then uh, on leaf area, then number of tillers, then number of heads per plant, etc. All the processes you will come to know. All the processes are weather influenced, and then it indirectly influences the pests and diseases attack to the crop and weeds also, because the pests and diseases also need a favorable temperature, a combination of temperature and humidity. Only then that uh, fungus or that pathogen survives, or that pest survives. So um, totally, uh, the our crop production is weather dependent. Then there's another term is that is weather. Um, weather is the instantaneous state of the atmosphere at one um, particular time. So this time it is raining after one. So it, the weather is rainy, but after one hour it will be sunny. So uh, that is the instantaneous change in the atmospheric condition at a particular time. In the morning, it was uh, not raining. It was dry. So that is weather. But once we study this weather over a period of 30 years, and then we take out the climatic normals, and then that is defined as climate. So the climate decides which crops you can grow in a particular region. Uh, so that means you can have mango in uh, Jammu, not in Kashmir, and you can have lemon in Jammu, not in Kashmir, but you can have apple in Kashmir, and not in Jammu. So that is the difference in the climate. But the day-to-day -day yield, uh, the day-to-day, -day, what the crop is now that it is climate decides what crop is grown in which area, then it is not influencing it. It is the weather that influences its um, everything, the stand, the germination percentage, then its growth, then whether it will go into flowering or not, then upon its yield also. So that is the initial difference between the weather and the climate. And the um, principal weather parameters influencing crop production are that's precipitation. I will be using a pointer. Give me one minute. So we'll be uh, precipitation. Precipitation is in the form of rainfall, hail, or uh, any form snow. So in Kashmir, for example, we have this ma major of precipitation in the winters that comes as in the form of snowfall or in the come rainfall and then we have another source of uh, precipitation that is hail which is very 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 aberrant to our uh, um, apple production or to our uh, uh, many crop productions because we often have spring hails and autumn hails we are having off and on hails so all the forms of precipitation and then its amount whether 
how much amount you receive um, in the season uh, plays a role, important role. And then it's distribution. Distribution means it may uh, we may have a normal rainfall year because if we calculate the normals of a uh, of a year, so we say okay, 625 mm we have got it. But it's distribution whether when our crop that particular crop needed the rainfall, whether it it was on those days or not, whether we got the rainy days when our crop needed or not. So that is uh, we call it about the distribution. So at that particular stage, if the crop is in need of irrigation, and if we do not have irrigation, if we have the source of irrigation, it's OK. But if it's a rain-fed crop, or we are anticipating we used to have rainfall at this very particular time, and then this year it did not happen, so that will influence our crop yield. Then air temperature, maximum and minimum. To every uh, crop, there is a temperature requirement. And uh, the maximum temperature of the day, as well as the minimum temperature of the day, both of them play a very vital role in our crop production. The moisture content of the air, which we normally call relative humidity or saturation vapor pressure deficit. This is very important, because uh, if even if the temperature is normal, but the Relative humidity is very high. That means if you are a saturated air parcel, 100% saturation is over there, then there will be no, um, no transpiration. Or if the, the relative humidity of the uh, air is very dry, the air is the unit air parcel is dry and the relative humidity is less, that means it will take away, uh, more of transpiration will be uh, there, and it will take away all the uh, water content. And that may not be very good if we don't have uh, irrigated crop. Then we have solar radiation or sunshine hours. All the um, uh, processes is because of the solar radiation. And uh, this is um, uh, all the weather parameters start with the sun. With So that is solar radiation or sunshine hours. Because you know some crops are uh, having, some are uh, day neutral, but the others have a critical day length. And they will only flower when they have the critic. They meet the critical day length. Then wind speed, wind speed as well as wind direction is very important. But here we take a, a, into account wind speed because uh, if the speed of wind is very high, then they uh, they can desiccate our crops or they can um, go for lodging. We should be having a gentle breeze for pollination. So some things there are very important. Wind speed, the types of wind uh, speeds we get. Uh, leave uh, hurricanes, hurricanes or cyclones, but in the crop season, the normal wind speed, which we do not even know, they are playing, when we take the microclimate into consideration, they are playing a lot of role because of, you know, stomata closing, transpiration. So uh, when it became important, the crop weather relationship, because first of all, agriculture metrology or for weather forecasting became uh, very as a must subject, uh, because in the World War, when they had to go for bombings and all, and they were not able to do it, they would plan that they would go for the bombing, and then the weather would not be there uh, feasible for it. Uh, for to do it, then they became very uh, conscious that we should be having a weather forecasting facility. And then aviation metrology came up, and then um, pure metrology came up. Settle then satellite map metrology came up. Then this, uh, then it was noted that uh, the crops, which I said earlier, that if they are the farmer is using the same variety, the same field, the same seed, the same fertilizer. <laughs> But uh, there, but the yield is thin. so that became the uh, basis for the crop weather relationship studies, and the first can be traced back to Fisher in 1924. And in India, the crop weather relationship studies were initiated by Professor Ali Ram, Ali Ramdas in 1926. Later, in 1932, IMD started crop weather studies. And in 1948, ICR started crop weather relationship through a coordinated crop weather scheme. And uh, uh, after that, they started uh, Grameen Krishi Mosan. First of all, it was called uh, Integrated uh, Agreement Advisory Services. Then um, NCMRWF was there. And then uh, it got merged with this. And now it is the crop weather scheme. And uh, IMG is having a Grameen Krishi Mosan Seva so that we uh, do the forecasting for the farmers. 
and then we make a agro advisory and then we give it to the farmers and in 1983 a multi locational crop weather relationship studies in various crops was initiated by ecripam and it's going on in, in 18 universities then uh, they realized the importance of other climatic factors and multivariate crop weather relationships were developed first initially two or three factors were taken into consideration and then statistical methods were developed and then crop uh, dynamic crop simulation models have been developed and now we are having a lot of crop simulation uh, models in which many crops even initially uh, rice uh, rice and wheat they would work now then on pulses then on forages now we are having also for uh, plantation crops uh, we have a chaman we have fasal so we have ceres rice ceres oriza so now projects like chaman and fasal have come up for plantation crops also then first of all what when our weather when we talk about weather the first of all the thing that starts is the sun so sun is the um, energy uh, energy provider and 99.99% of the energy that is uh, on our in your, in your uh, earth is because of the uh, sun and whatever we harvest is of actually the solar radiation whether you are ha harvesting it as a green fodder it is the photosynthesis whether you are harvesting it as at a ye, um, grain stage it's still the photosynthesis so photosynthesis is produced because you know when there is only sunlight so whatever we harvest is the sunlight itself so whatever we are eating harvesting and whatever we work are doing the energy on this earth is because of solar radiation only and 0.01% is also the solar radiation but indirect solar radiation because when the mm, solar radiation fall over on our earth some of it is reflected back some is absorbed the reflected back if it's from the mm, because it's from the terrestrial objects we call it a terrestrial radiation and the long wave radiation the solar radiation is the short wave radiation so that terrestrial radiation is the another source of heat but that is indirectly the solar radiation similarly the radiation from the moon which we get during the night that is also indirectly the solar radiation so 100% is basically the solar radiation and some radiations from the stars it is also bis bis they are reflecting the solar radiation so the general effects are the photo energy processes we, which we know that is and mostly most important the photosynthesis then photo stimulus processes movement processes nastic movements movement of orientation you know phototropism you must have known about it tropism tactic movements then formative processes which are very important and this also takes the light quality stem elongation if you expose it to far red it will not be elongated if you uh, expose this to uh, red uh, there will be more stem elongation and sometimes uh, we the uh, breeders needs these idiotypes so they can uh, we can manipulate the light and get uh, whatever we want so stem elongation the leaf expansion uh, the pigment formation then the pubescence uh, flowering in photoperiodically sensitive plants because day neutral or only which uh, do not take into the length um, day length into consideration but uh, which we have short day plants and long day plants we will be needing it for them then formation of photochlorophyll and then anthocyanin formation and then because of the solar radiation we have uh, the temperature rises up so because we absorb the heat and then uh, we uh, Uh, re radiate it also so that we we get temperature so temperature you know is the sensible heat if what whatever we are feeling that is when we express the degree of hotness or coldness it is called as temperature so it uh, the effects on its crops variation duration of phenological events sometimes if the temperature is very uh, good and then our phenological events they Uh, they take a lot of time or if the temperature is not and they are facing stress the phenological stages will take uh, the uh, the vegetative stage may take lesser days and it may come into flowering because we know that whenever a crop faces stress it wants to it it has a tendency to flower and so this thing is very important for your phenol uh, for your forage crops then variation in magnitude and time of occurrence of peaking biomass this is also important for the point of view of our forage that if the temperature is less or if it is increasing then there will be lesser biomass 
then significant increase and decrease in the growth rates and variation in growth pattern deviating from sigmoidal curve. Ultimately, it affects the grain yield and harvest index. So these three, four points, although temperature has a, have, has a varied role, but I have put it uh, what is very important for the uh, from the forage point of view. So if we take, um, there is one uh, term that is called as temp uh, cardinal temperature. So cardinal temperature has a three category, minimum, optimum, and maximum. Minimum uh, means below this uh, uh, minimum temperature, this is the lowest that uh, the crop can bear. So below this uh, temperature, it will not be able to grow, and it will be having stress. And then the maximum that a crop plant can uh, bear is 31, is uh, uh, this maximum temperature. And above it, the crop will not uh, grow at all. It will be um, harsh for the crop to live. So these three things are called the cardinal temperatures, minimum, uh, maximum, and then optimum. Optimum is an ideal on at which the maximum crop growth takes place. So this is the ideal which we should be having. And so for cool season, the minimum temperature is 0 to 5 degree. And um, the ideal for it, the optimum is 25 to 31. And for maximum 31 to 37, it cannot uh, exceed uh, this temperature. It will not be able to bear 31 to 37. I mean, some crops will be uh, will desiccate at 31 and um, some hardy um, some cool season crop may desiccate at 37 but it may not it is the height they can bear after it they cannot bear then for hot season crops this um, 15 to 18 is the minimum and 31 to 37 is the optimum and 44 to 50 is the maximum although these ranges are different for different crops but this is a thumb rule type if we do not remember of a particular um, particular plant but we only know that it is a cool season crop or it's a hot, hot season crop then we can use this thumb rule this is just a thumb rule although it varies from each crop maize has a different um, requirement rice has different requirements similarly barseem has different requirements all the crops have different requirements and the uh, uh, high temperature effects on five major crops that is uh, for if wheat the temperature exceeds 30 degrees centigrade for uh, 30 degrees celsius for eight hours it can reverse vernalization and in rice uh, if it is more than 35 then and this is um, there will be spikelet sterility because the dehiscence will not be there but in kashmir also we had another uh, uh, in rice we have another problem that is uh, if our temperature uh, falls uh, below 20 degrees centigrade in the month of august when our <coughs> anthesis is taking place then also we can get the spikelet sterility because you see <coughs> it is going below the optimum <coughs> And then in maize, uh, more than 36 uh, degree uh, Celsius can reduce the pollen viability. And in potato, more than 20 degree Celsius reduces the tuberization and bulking. And uh, the temperature threshold, uh, so from, mm, uh, for different crops, it is for wheat, uh, the lower is zero, optimum 17 to 23, and upper 30 to 35. In rice, we have 7 to 12, optimum 25 to 30, and upper is 35 to 38. So this is uh, which we should be having, whether the rice is grown in Punjab or the rice is grown in Kashmir. So this is the optimum temperature it is having. So that is why we schedule our date of sowings. We schedule our date of sowings in this way that we should be getting, the Punjab should be getting this much temperature at that time, and we should also be getting this much of temperature at that time. And the higher that uh, Punjab is getting is 35 to 38, so it is able to uh, bear it. But once this thing is crossed, you will see in Punjab also, there, then uh, there is dehiscence or there is um, spikelets, sterility is there. So that is why, that is why we are planning the date of sowing. Although to some, the date of sowing may not be uh, looking like a very good good uh, deal but it is once we consider these optimum temperatures or the day length or the solar radiation the angle of sun these are very important we only then so planning of sowing of a crop is extremely important and when you are planning the sowing of the crop you have to see what uh, type of yield you are wanting do you want grains or do you want the fodder leaves so if you are wanting the leaf you have to see 
that uh, you have to plant it in such a way that a maximum of biomass is produced maximum of biomass is produced in a in a period in which you want to have it or if you if i am going for the for example in rice i want the grain so i have to see when uh, i should go for sowing so that it will get a good vegetative uh, growth and then it will get its critical day length so that it will flower at the at a, at the time when the optimum day length is there it will flower but at, it it should coincide with the optimum temperature also so that is what why we are going for the uh, day, um, a lot of research is being done on the date of sowing it is and if um, for example to me somebody will say hey you are going for date of sowing again kya abhi tak iska date nahi hua i said no the climate is changing the pattern is changing so today also the date of sowing of experiments for different crops is very important especially if you want a staggered harvest so staggered growth uh, date of sowing you have to see if you are you want to have more biomass and you have to see which date of sowing got me the uh, good for example uh, leaf area you want or leaf biomass you want you don't want more of green so that way this 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 plays the role there uh, uh, these things decide the yield so in maize uh, because maize uh, you, we have some fodder maize also so for um, initially these are the temperature requirements for whole maize but when uh, i say about the fodder then that means my um, um, objective is to get more of bio biomass so not the uh, cob so that time also we have to see when we should go for it sowing and we have to see when the maximum uh, leaf uh, only we can get, have the maximum of vegetative uh, growth so in maize uh, lower is 18 to 13 and optimum is 25 to 30 and the upper is 32 to 37 in potato we have 5 to 10 15 to 20 25 25 is the upper and uh, so this is also one of the reason in uh, indian plains like punjab haryana the potato is uh, sown in the month of october or november and in kashmir we are sowing it in the month of march so uh, mainly uh, this is the reason because the optimum because if the temperature exceeds 20 degree then there is no stolon formation the potato tubers do not form so that gets a problem so according to when temperature required for physiological activities of all plants range between 0 and 40 degree centigrade and the optimal for various growth plants is 25 degree these are thumb rules which we uh, remember for most cultivated plants 21 to 32 is the best range these things we remember uh, that okay so no that it is about 40 degree so we have a easy way out then the yield is like theek nahi and we we are not getting a good crop so these are some of the thumb rules which we remember as agrometrologists and you know that the, the uh, temperature is the driving force behind most physiological process that occur in a plant and these include photosynthesis respiration translocation of nutrients carbon partitioning and cell wall formation why i am i have used this para here because we have related it with one of your important forage that's alpha alpha um, it stands to reason that changing temperature will have a dramatic impact on what goes inside the plant we see these effects each and every year when comparing alpha alpha regrowth and forage quality in summer to that of the regrowth and quality in the fall alpha alpha can actually increase in quality over time in the fall as a result of cooler growing temperatures because i was just yesterday reading one paper about the what will be the change in the climate change uh, the effect on the uh, for the production and i uh, saw that uh, they the scientists are saying that the increase in the temperature will reduce our forage quality so that is because uh, these processes will be influenced and so that's why they are preferring matlab um, as um, a bit uh, lower the optimum temperature so as the temperature of the growing environment increases it has a following overall effects on plant growth and forage quality that is it can decrease the stem diameter it can accelerate the rate of maturity it can increase lignification it can decrease the plant height and it can decrease leaf stem ratio and decreases the digestibility so here we are relating the um, uh, if uh, there are chances of climate change and if the temperature is going to rise these factors for the forage quality will be influenced 
and um, the high ambient temperature bring about rapid rate of maturity of forages and a rise in the cell wall content. So this occurs in the stems and leaves of both temperate and tropical grasses, but the change is more pronounced in the tropical forages. The rate of plant maturation rises with temperature. For example, in alpha alpha grown at 63 degree Fahrenheit may take 52 days to reach early bloom, but only 21 days at 90 degree Fahrenheit. As forage is mature, there is an increase in cell wall content and a decrease in the digestibility of the cell wall. So this is the effect of temperature on cell wall content. So this is, see, we see with the increase in the temperature, the uh, cell wall content is increased. So this is what the uh, people who are working for development of forages have to take into consideration with their they want when they are uh, they want a good quality forage then photoperiodism and solar radiation the three aspects of solar radiation which are important for uh, plant processes is the intensity duration uh, intensity that's the for um, uh, you know if uh, we are having three types of uh, plants one are the we, heliotypes heliophytes they love sun so they want to have maximum solar radiation on them. And then the other is shade loving, cesiophytes. So they, they need lesser time, uh, lesser intensity of uh, light. But what happens is when the photosynthesis takes place, when the light is incident on a crop plant, it uh, there's a there is a limit to which it can absorb and work upon. After that, even if more light is coming, there will be no further rate of uh, increase in the photosynthesis. That that point we call as saturation light intensity, and that saturation light intensity varies for different crops. So that is very important in our um, um, agrometrological studies because uh, what happens in photosynthesis is that it is not a 100% efficient process. Some of the photosynthates, some of the light that is incident upon the plant is not utilized for the um, not utilized for uh, photosynthesis because we know that whenever light falls it uh, three things happens it reflects it is absorbed some of it is reflected and some of it is percolated down so uh, the if, if the structure of the leaf is such that if the uppermost leaf is uh, um, uh, transmitting the light down the lower leaf must be a little bit horizontal so that it is the leaf that uh, the, that sunlight will penetrate on uh, that and then um, that leaf will work upon so that is the idiotype we want and most of it um, in most of the crops we don't have uh, but uh, maize is a little bit more um, efficient in utilizing the solar light because of its the structure of the leaves then duration photo period or day length which i spoke uh, about the critical day length and uh, if they will flower and then quality which type because sometimes uh, all the the web goer the the whole spectrum of um, uh, the visible light is important and especially the par uh, photosynthetic active radiation we know the intensity influence growth by altering the size of organs by influencing the photosynthesis. Here, uh, you are uh, a field scientist and a forage scientist will be uh, having varied interests. So if he wants, um, the agronomist wants more of the yield, um, for example, he wants more of seed yield, but a forage, forage scientist wants more of leaf or biomass. So this is that the intensity where uh, the solar intense light intensity influences. So photo period is primarily influential in controlling the phenological stages of flower formation and timing of the flag leaf appearance so photo period also decides because if the temperature is okay and but uh, you you have sown it a bit late and the crop has not yet developed uh, up to knee high stage or it has just crossed the knee high stage but it will come into uh, flowering because now um, it has met the critical day length so you cannot stop it from flowering but the biomass is less so these things are very important so if we take high light intensity, it increases the content of water-soluble carbohydrates, whereas high temperature decreases water-soluble uh, carbohydrates. So light intensity and temperature, they uh, are having different uh, aspects. See, if there is light, high light intensity, it will increase the water-soluble carbohydrates. But if we are ha having high temperature, it will decrease the water-soluble carbohydrates. Here also, we have to see what is needed, what is needed for the um, better quality uh, of our forage. 
and with high light intensity the cell wall content also decreases for example during the spring uh, here um, alpha alpha grows under longer day length and lower temperature thus its cell wall content is lowest and digestible by dry matter mm, is at its highest so this is what is uh, taken into consideration for uh, our forages the higher temperature during mid summer causes an increase in cell wall content with a corresponding decrease in digestible dry matter therefore alpha alpha harvested at this time is at its lowest quality and both temperature and light contribute to cell wall content and a rise in cell wall content can lower the digestibility and intake by grazing animals and i was also uh, reading re yesterday that uh, the um, uh, methane emissions from and this uh, from animals is going to increase with increase in temperature although the number of ruminant number of cattle may be same but that is expected uh, because uh, the uh, it's indirectly uh, depending on the forage quality so when i was um, going through it yesterday forages grown under high temperatures have a higher stem to leaf ratio this is where our forage scientist is um, much interested so grazing animals prefer leaves when the animals select leaves instead of consuming the whole plant bite size and the rate of intake are decreased hence leaf to stem ratio can be related to the cell wall content and feeds that have high cell wall content have higher heat increment and even at smaller intake energy levels thus the cell wall content of forages grown during summer can impact utilization of energy and cell wall content and can be altered by temperature and solar radiation so this is very important for a forage scientist and that is why he has to take into consideration the right time of uh, sowing of uh, that fodder or forage whatever then we have rainfall rainfall is an important parameter in agriculture and rainfall is the main source providing water to plants too much or too little rainfall can be harmful and water is an essential component in the process of photosynthesis movement out of stomata that is transpiration and uh, this is the um, we, we know that um, if there's photosynthesis there will be transpiration and they are in that related with each other and as transpiration and photosynthesis are interrelated a linear relationship between yield and transpiration uh, has been given by hanks that is the yield depends upon the seasonal transpiration divided by the um, um, actual evapotranspiration that takes place and this m is a uh, crop factor and yield usually show curvilinear relationship with rainfall in most of the crops the yield response to rainfall varies with the phenological stage of the crop and in most of the field crops rainfall during the reproductive stage is critical for grain yield achieved then uh, we have some methods to evaluate crop weather relationships they are correlation techniques or crop weather analysis model or crop growth simulation models and some of the <coughs> equations are a moisture availability index uh, which takes into consideration the 75% probability of rainfall and uh, this is the actual evapotranspiration that can uh, take place uh, from a crop um, uniformly growing crop and it is called uh, potential evapotranspiration then we have moisture adequacy index that is um, um, actual uh, evapotranspiration divided by the potential evapotranspiration then we have water uh, requirements uh, satisfaction index that also takes into consideration the actual evapotranspiration and the actual water crop water requirement so we will be knowing about the crop water requirement and then how much of uh, e aeg has happened and then we multiply it by 100 and we get the uh, water requirement satisfaction index and we can schedule our irrigation that way and we have also a penman monteith method in which we first derive the crop coefficient and then uh, we have the potential evapotranspiration and then we calculate the crop water requirement then if we take into consideration the temperature only uh, the one of our uh, this um, index is growing degree days or <clears throat> now it is also called as heat <coughs> heat units uh, it is maximum temperature plus minimum temperature divided by two that is the average temperature so the uh, today's average temperature okay then we minus it by a base temperature base temperature of the crop means below which the that crop will not survive at all the growth of that crop will not be there so this is the average temperature maximum plus minimum divided by two and how much today for example i will take today 
so how much of the temperature was available to the plant to grow so that means the base temperature for example in potato is 5 degree or 4.5 degree or for rice it is 10 degree so if today the temperature the average temperature was 20 so the 10 it there is no growth below 10 so about 10 it has grown so it it got 20 minus 10 means 10 10 degree it got so that we get say growing degree days and then we calculate it for the whole season first um, all phenological wise so, so you get the data for all and then we see for different phenophases it has a particular um, uh, heat requirement and when this is met only then it will go into the uh, second um, phenophase for example from germination to knee high or from uh, knee high to tessel so this way when it will meet its growing degree days when it meet its heat requirement only then it will go into the next uh, next stage although if if it is not met these temperature but you have get got get a critical day length then the problem is there so we say that see it it it, it was not able to have its heat requirements uh, in this very stage so that is why the yield is less or the biomass is less or the days taken were more or less so we have some modifications because a lot of work was done on it and then we say that sometimes what happens is that which happens to in Kashmir uh, this is a practical problem which we get here for example you know rubby crops our uh, temperature requirement base temperature is 4.5 degrees centigrade but our average is only one or sometimes it's zero or two if we are, are having a minus temperature so that time we take the average temperature as the base temperature and in, in some areas what happens is that the te average temperature is greater than the upper threshold then also there we take the average temperature equal to upper threshold then we have another method then when um, the maximum temperature or the minimum temperature is less than the base temperature then we take that ma that maximum or minimum whatever the case was that we take that equal to the base temperature and or another is when the maximum or minimum temperature is greater than um, upper threshold temperature then we take that one as equal to the upper threshold temperature these were the practical problems which we were facing in calculation of the growing degree days and then this um, modification was done and approved and as a uh, layman i can tell you that uh, even if our student doesn't remember the uh, base temperatures for the different crops they vary but as a thumb rule we have uh, 10 degree as for the kharif crops in kashmir and four to five degree as rabi crops in kashmir so but they do vary from stage to stage also from crop to crop they vary and from even from the stage to stage at us at the time of sowing or for example in rice in at the time of nursery it has a lower temperature requirement but when it is in tilling and uh, early dove stage it has a higher uh, temperature requirement so the base temperature also then uh, it was modified upon the base temperature also uh, varies with the phenological stages then when we calculate these degree days and for each day we um, multiply it with the day length we get the photothermal units and then uh, this degree day we multiply it with the actual bright sunshine hours we get the heliothermal units and then we have another that is thermal interception rate that is we take um, into consideration the photosynthetically active radiation intercepted by the crop and we see the change in the temperature above the base temperature what it was this is again the gdd here uh, the mean daily temperature mean daily over the uh, base temperature so this is also when you have this gdd um, the relation with the photosynthetically active radiation so radiation and water use efficiency of some of the crops uh, we see because I told you this um, the leaf orientation in maize is very good so we have a, and it's a C4 plant also so we have a higher radiation use efficiency and higher uh, water use efficiency also in maize and sorghum and then followed by uh, castor and wheat and groundnut and soya bean have uh, less uh, radiation use uh, in efficiency and uh, here this is um, uh, groundnut has uh, uh, groundnut has a better groundnut and soya bean have better uh, water use efficiency than wheat and castor because see in Kashmir also we see that wheat gets a plenty of uh, precipitation during the winters but 
uh, th that gets wasted. So that is um, so that means uh, if it is not being used because our wheat crop remains in dormancy at that time, so that is why its efficiency is considered to be lower. So then we have again uh, some um, correlation studies can be uh, taken up between yield and uh, temperature, between yield and precipitation, uh, between yield and day length, and we can go for uh, correlation analysis to study the crop weather relationships, or we can go for regression analysis, or we can have both of them with one variable or two variable or with multiple variables. And uh, so we, so that means we are having uh, multivariate analysis, linear analysis. And uh, there is another one small equation which we use for dry matter yield to transpiration because here uh, it is uh, important for um, in point uh, keeping forages in uh, mind. So that is uh, the, over that yield will depend upon the transpiration and it will be divided by the average free water evaporation rate and M is the crop factor which vary from crop to crop. And then uh, we have also uh, this uh, A by P ratio that is known as moisture adequacy index. And then we are having many crop factors. Uh, if we go for uh, this FAO and Ritchie water balance model, we can um, devise, uh, we have the equations devised for the water requirement of different crops. And water balance model is water requirement satisfaction index, which I already explained. So these are some of the models which we can use for crop weather studies. Then we have radiation use efficiency, that is the quantity of biomass produced per unit of interceptor radiation. This is very important from the forage point of view. Then we have also the water use efficiency, that is amount of dry matter produced by a crop per unit of water transpired. Right? And they can be used for yield simulation through the following relation, that is yield is equal to radiation absorbed into radiation use efficiency into harvest index, or yield is total water use into water use efficiency into uh, harvest index and then we have uh, Duran Bose at all 1979 this is a very important model it's still going on and uh, uh, that is we are having this as a potential yield and this is the uh, yield response uh, factor so and this is the actual crop uh, evapotranspiration and this is the maximum or the uh, potential which we can uh, have so by this equation we are also getting the actual yield so if we take different crops a uh, little bit, um, I'll be working on, uh, be telling you about some of two or three crops, quarter crops. And uh, one of the most important one is the alpha alpha and its uh, distribution in the world indicates that it has a remarkable adaptability to various climates and soils. Uh, though the crop requires considerable moisture to produce profitable yield, it does best in relatively dry climate where water is available for irrigation. And uh, in the combination of high humidity, high precipitation, and high temperatures is particularly unfavorable. Because I said in the initial also, because uh, of the cell wall content and the high temperature is going to degrade the forage quality. Then um, it has been observed that in some instances where the precipitation is less than 500 millimeter annually and irrigation is not possible, the high water requirement of alpha alpha has resulted in the exhaustion of the sub, sub uh, soil moisture. It was observed that when sown a second time on the same land, the yields were far from satisfactory because it had used up all the uh, soil moisture uh, which was present in there. Although somewhat secondary to temperature, soil moisture status can also have a significant impact on alpha alpha growth and forage quality. Mature alpha alpha is about 75 to 80% water. So in a ton, in a two ton dry matter per acre standing crop, this translates to eight tons of water. So that means only 1% of the water that enters a growing plant is retained. So water and lots of it is essential for alpha alpha growth and any moisture deficit situation will have physiological ramifications and drought conditions tend to delay the plant maturity if it occurs early in the growth cycle and it decreases the plant height, it increases the leaf stem ratio and generally decreases the NGF percent. It will survive a long period of drought, but it's not productive under such conditions because I already said that the uh, drought, the, these things will happen. In plant height will decrease, which is not needed, increases leaf stem ratio or generally decreases NDF percent. 
so <clears throat> it will survive a long period drought but it's not so well adapted to humid climate and uh, because acid soils are developed under uh, heavy precipitation and mostly the diseases take place most of the fungal diseases take place in humid uh, when uh, the crop is when the climate is humid or the soil is very wet or the plant is very wet and uh, uh, when uh, we had a crop um, in one research paper it was found that when they had sown the first crop of uh, this uh, alpha alpha and then there was no irrigation so that crop exhausted the subsoil moisture to a depth of 40 feet so that the subsequent seeding which they had the another crop that they had to depend on the annual precipitation which was not sufficient to meet the requirement for maximum production because we need most of it, the biomass. And uh, in also alpha alpha, it has been seen that winter killing is often associated with lack of sufficient moisture during the preceding summer and fall by which the vigor of the plants has been reduced to such an extent that they are unable to endure low temperatures. And heavy freezing and thawing is responsible for um, serious losses in some usually where the soil is saturated with moisture and a direct correlation is often shown between soil moisture whether from precipitation or irrigation and losses from the disease bacterial build develops more rapidly where soil moisture is abundant and other conditions favor vigorous growth certain leaf and stem diseases and yellowing due to the potato leaf hopper and are usually more destructive under humid than dry conditions and alpha alpha is more tolerant to extremes of heat and cold than most of the perennials but these are some of the things which have been um, considered for the climatic requirements and the influence of weather on alpha alpha so we have this words as freezing and thawing thawing means when uh, the soil temperature is also uh, not conducive and soil is saturated and then we are having thawing and freezing in heaving and freezing sometimes we have intercellular uh, cells freezing the gaps between the cells is freezing and sometimes um, because the water level remains over it and the water freezes and then it causes the uh, suffocation to the plant then in Barsim, it's a cool weather crop it needs cool weather for better growth However, excessive cold, hot and dry weather may retard the growth. Freezing temperature of 4.5 degrees centigrade may kill the plants and high temperature stimulates flowering and seed production. Longer period of cool temperature facilitates growth and yield of the crop. So we have to see what for we are going to sow it, whether we are going to sow it for a green uh, fodder or whether we want it seed production. So that is why we always uh, insist upon the correct time of sowing. Then in hybrid Napier, it grows well under tropical conditions, but the optimum temperature requirement for this is below um, 15 degrees centigrade and bright sunshine coupled with light showers are congenial for the crop growth. Then we have Lucerne. It's adapted to warm temperature and cool subtropical regions. And then it has hot dry climate is um, mostly suitable for it. Crop will not thrive in hot humid regions. And growth of seedling is higher with the temperature of 20 to 30 degrees centigrade. It can tolerate a short span of drought. And water logging and high humidity in the rainy season are detrimental to the crop growth. Thank you. So it's open for discussion if somebody wants to ask. Because we have not done a lot of work on climate uh, crop with the relationship in uh, for the forages but uh, we should be doing it especially it's very important uh, as the um, biomass which uh, a fodder scientist needs that's extremely important so over to dr sohail yeah everyone having it yeah anyone I having it maybe i was <laughs> Hello? Anyone having any questions, please ask. Um, you can stop sharing. Any questions? Uh, madam? 
yes madam yes yes madam good morning madam i am uh, dr hari krishna from andhra pradesh uh, veterinary college gannavaram yes. hello yes 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 go ahead uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 Ma madam. Uh, there is a variety uh, now widely um, cultivated in the powder varieties by, by Super Napier. So, to which category it belongs, madam? Super Napier. Super Napier. Yeah. Category means now the madam. Category. You want to know what? Ah, yeah, yeah, madam. Because now the farmers in Andhra Pradesh they are. Uh, uh more inclined and they are uh, cultivating this improved variety of fodder madam super napier uh, so i want Better to know about it madam whether it is a day a day length uh, day neutral day critical that, that may be short day or long day you want to know about that or you'd want to know whether it no, is no 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 we are between uh, which um, varieties it was a cross man it was a pro how it was produced i don't know about that how uh, yeah, you will okay. be Hail and all uh, fodder scientists, uh, but uh, this time what we are trying to do is for fodders they want a day neutral, uh, day neutral variety so that most of the biomass is there, because okay, uh, okay. they want uh, biomass. What we are stressing is if they want more of leaf, so the okay. readers have to see that uh, okay. they should be getting the varieties which are able to get more of biomass. More. Okay, they, they, okay. Uh, yeah. They do not go into uh, early flowering because once okay. the crop goes into flowering, then uh, the leaves do uh, do not have that much biomass left. You know about the yeah. crop this ratio. So uh, the breeders have to take into consideration if we are going for, for example, we have African tall maize. There are the the varieties which we want for cob. They are not so tall, no. So, but African tall and other um, fodder maize varieties are very tall because there the breeders have kept into mind what is the requirement of the farmer. The requirement of the farmer in for a uh, forage uh, forage uh, variety is more of the biomass and more mm -hmm. of the leaves, lesser of the stems, and those ratios they have to maintain. So that way they have to take into consideration, and uh, for that also, then the um, all these weather parameters, all these factors are very important. Thank you, thank you, man. Actually, your uh, this session is very informative, and uh, we came to know about uh, so many unknown facts, madam, like uh, mm -hmm. biomass, how to increase the leafy portion. Thank you, madam. Mm -hmm. It's a very informative session. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question, please? Is there any question regarding the topic? If uh, Doxa, if we are having some scientists over here uh, who are working on forders and forages, so we can have uh, some study to be done uh, in which we can have, like we do it for rice, maize, we have been doing it uh, for those. Uh, that we can have the um, phenological stages identified and we can have the temperature and solar radiation uh, data and then we can calculate how much of uh, uh, actually the um, heat units are being consumed for one unit of biomass produced for fodder because we do it for yield um, for rice wheat maize we have done it we have done those studies and yesterday i was realizing that we have not done much on the fodder crops which are very important and now uh, with the change in the climate also uh, we are going to produce more more of biomass from lesser uh, the land resources are available and uh, we have to keep the cattle if we had to take the milk and milk products then we have to keep the cattle there's no way that we can say no there's there will be some replacement for milk or for uh, eggs or any uh, mil um, animal products which we are getting uh, that is uh, indirectly we are getting it from the fodder or the forages so fodder and for forage production has to increase because uh, the pasture lands are decreasing and there's a lot of stress on this so if um, i request dr suhail also that we will have a uh, it's not necessary to have a project but it can, it's a necessary to have a interlinked study uh, we can uh, have an interlinked study study with all these fodders and forages 
so that is if some of the scientists from other places also uh, they can also contribute towards it dr sail you want to come in and say something sir dr sail hello dr sail sir you must be busy uh, i think vaishansa is visiting there today na okay yeah, yeah, i guess ah, yeah ah. if there are uh, any further questions then we can uh, uh, go towards the conclusion of the session is uh, is there any further question okay ma'am uh, i think there are no further questions uh, on behalf of uh, nadcl uh, on behalf of the participants i would like to thank you uh, for providing uh, with us uh, with this wonderful knowledge and interactive session thank you ma'am thanks a lot thank you thank you for inviting me and thanks to all the participants uh, thank you and have a good day thank you thank you ma'am thank you allah hafiz so much allah Uh, uh all the participants are uh, can leave and join back at uh, uh 2:30 which is the second session thank you